one day out from the indictment dropping, we are going to dig into the revelations with you because the evidence backs up the charges that Trump conspired to defraud the U.S., obstruct an official proceeding and the right to vote, and attempted to obstruct those proceedings. Now, some of the thwarted attempts were stopped. Some of the plots worked up to a point. Remember, and Smith uses this in the indictment, Trump's efforts did delay the certification of President-elect Biden's win on January 6th. It did not happen at the appointed time. Smith exposes that Trump officials within the government, including one you see on your screen, were ready for violence in advance, including a chilling exchange with Jeffrey Clark, an unindicted co-conspirator. He worked at DOJ, and he tried to hijack that entire department, which, again, interestingly, is now charging Donald Trump and lists him as an unindicted co-conspirator. Clark tried to overthrow his bosses. He wanted to help steal the election. And a White House lawyer told Clark the legal fact that Trump would vacate the White House for President-elect Biden on January 20th. And any attempted coup would, of course, be met with protests and riots. Smith exposes that Clark responded, that's why there's an insurrection act. Think about what that means tonight, because that's coming from inside the government. Trump's DOJ hack, now an unindicted co-conspirator, raising the idea that then outgoing President Trump might use military force to hold on to power, to crush protests. That's incriminating. And... There were signs that the military National Guard would not follow any attempted illegal orders by the outgoing president. Indeed, there was reporting on that, you may recall. But by the end of January 6th, those forces were called into halt. The fans of Donald Trump and their now convicted crimes, not to help Trump illegally stay in office. That new evidence suggests Smith has notes or testimony from the person on the other end of that conversation. The same path to new details on how Trump tried to issue illegal demands for Vice President Pence, as the charges even cite contemporaneous notes by Pence, which means the Vice President, like former FBI Director Comey, figured out that when Trump starts making sketchy or illegal demands, you need receipts. Consider the tantalizing new detail of a key conversation. This was five days before the riot, something we hadn't known before. Pence telling investigators how Trump was berating Pence by phone, and then when Pence stated the obvious fact that the Constitution barred him from trying to steal the election for himself and Trump on January 6th, Trump responded, quote, you're too honest. Everyone saw the danger Pence faced from Trump fans. Security videos showed Pence fleeing from the mob, his boss unleashed. Now, the indictment shows late into the night, after Pence fled, after law enforcement restored order, after everything went down, Trump and his aides continued their plot to hijack the certification. They used that violence and pressed on. It shows Trump trying to reach two senators as late as 6 p.m. that day. That's after everything went down. And Smith ends the speaking indictment with that as the damning climax, showing that while the nation saw the Senate reconvene on that same floor, ransacked by Trump fans and now convicted seditionists, and the nation heard really most senators join in a bipartisan opposition and even horror at the insurrection that just unfolded that sent them fleeing and running and scared. That word insurrection was first used on the floor that night by Republican Mitch McConnell. While that was the widespread public reaction, this new indictment shows how Trump and some of his aides were continuing the alleged conspiracy. Now, we pulled this for you tonight as part of this special report, because I got to tell you, after everything and how much the Republicans backslid, it can be easy to forget just how strongly even some of Trump's GOP allies were rebuking the insurrection that very night. We will not bow to lawlessness or intimidation. This failed insurrection only underscores how crucial the task before us is for our republic. All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. Now, those quotes are not offered tonight in the service of judgment or political hypocrisy or any of the other many ways that we've heard them in the past. They're offered in this legal special report for one evidentiary reason alone. To remind everyone, as Jack Smith does in this indictment, that that was the response from both parties. I could have shown you other members of Congress also, of course, rebuking that insurrection. It was taken as a kind of automatic, obvious thing that this was terrible and that they were going to move on to certify. 
Indeed, whatever you think of Donald Trump's very late tweets, even they publicly claimed that it was time to go home and be peaceful. But Jack Smith isn't just relying on what politicians say in public. So let me show you something that makes it a lot more likely Donald Trump could end up in prison. In secret, Trump and his unindicted co-conspirators continued on, as I showed you there, attempting to reach senators as late as 6 p.m. And there's more. It's worth recalling after all that, eight Republicans still backed the plot by voting against certifying Biden's win that night. Now, what were Donald Trump's unindicted co-conspirators pushing for in their last desperate pitch? You are forgiven if, if you don't exactly remember. Some of this was public. Some of this we're just learning from the indictment and its details. But this is important, again, for what a jury will hear and decide about whether to convict Trump, whether to send Trump to spend future days not in the Oval Office, but in a rectangular cage. Jack Smith notes that minutes before midnight, lawyer John Eastman was back at it, pressing Mike Pence's lawyer in writing in an email that they should still try to fraudulently claim when they reconvened that there was some sort of fake violation of the Electoral Count Act and adjourn for 10 days. That was the pitch. Just give us 10 more days to allow the legislatures to finish their investigations. You see 11.44 p.m. there at the top of your screen. That's from the indictment. This was after Pence fled for his life. The, the plotters were still trying to demand that he would join them in the plot hatched against him. And then what they wanted, those 10 days. Now listen to one of the Republicans who voted against certification that night after the violence, after the insurrection, after even most top Republicans and his own leader McConnell said this was a terrible insurrection. Listen to this Trump ally in the context that we have tonight asking for what? A 10-day delay. We've seen in the last two months unprecedented allegations of voter fraud. Conduct a 10-day emergency audit. Consider the evidence. That was the floor of the Senate, Jan 6, 10-day audit. That's how the night ended. But what's vital in this story, and we actually have a bit more on this later in this program, is how Smith broadens the case that you see here, not just one day, but a long-running coup conspiracy. So the fraudulent electors plot, which begins on the upper left of your screen as marked green because initially there was nothing illegal about lining up the possibility of other electors. That was weeks prior, and it continues turning to something else by the time you get to January. This began with the range of sham proceedings, as Smith calls them, across seven states designed to fraudulently instill some kind of doubt about lawful Biden electors there. And then Giuliani giving lying presentations. By the way, he recently admitted under legal pressure that he was lying on some of the matters. Trump aides were so desperate, they even lied to their own most hardcore Republican fans that they recruited to join the plot. Again, from the indictment, Giuliani falsely assured Republicans in Biden states like Pennsylvania they'd only use the certificates if Trump, the defendant, succeeded in litigation to win back that state. That was a lie. They don't just lie to, you know, the opponents or the referees or lie about the press holding them accountable. They're lying to their own most hardcore fans who were willing in December to join plots for someone who was clearly the outgoing and losing president, uh, losing to the president-elect. In another state, we see they didn't even have pending litigation. And again, this may sound like we're getting into details. These details are the difference in many cases between whether you have it all dead to rights and you convict the defendant or not. So Smith uncovers a detail to expose the nature of the fraud and how, because they had been assuring, the Trump folks had been assuring their fans, hey, we're only going to do this if this pending litigation works out. But in some states, they didn't even have litigation. So they ginned up a fake case, filing a new election suit in New Mexico six minutes before the noon deadline for the electors' votes as a pretext so there would be, quote, pending litigation there at the time the fraudulent electors voted. In reality, the Trump team, Team Coup, knew they'd already lost most cases. They knew that very last little fake case was just designed as a pretext. And the real plan was to push the fraudulent electors no matter what, which they did. All the way through January 6th, this is something we've 
shown you once before, courtesy of the January 6th committee's evidence, where they had this Senate aide trying to get a Senator Johnson to hand an elector fraud to Pence. That was as of 12.30 p.m. You see on the left, just minutes before Pence walked in. That's how long running this went all the way up to then. And you can see the response, do not give that to him. This was by the point that Pence aides were forming a phalanx to protect him from these criminal plots. And Smith has evidence the participants knew this was all wild. The indictment shows one unindicted co-conspirator plotting with a lawyer who literally describes this very plot I'm telling you about as kind of wild, creative. We'll be sending in fake electoral votes, that's a confession, to Pence so that, quote, someone in Congress can make an objection when they start counting votes. And they, these Trump supporters, would start arguing that the, quote, fake votes should be counted. Yeah, the scare quotes do a lot of work there. Now, why does Smith include that? It shows that even on the inside, they knew this was not about honestly debating the electors. It was about lying to create a fake debate so that Pence or someone might exploit it, which he refused to do. And why did he refuse to do that? It's not because he opposes Donald Trump. He's a loyal vice president. It's not because he was staking out some new position against Donald Trump. You've seen him campaign lately. He's very soft and supportive of Trump, despite the targeting that Trump fans did to try to murder him. Why did Mike Pence draw the line here and not in so many other places he might have? I can give you the answer tonight in a way that I couldn't have yesterday morning or any other point in time. I can give you the answer with a legal certitude. Mike Pence said no then, at the end of the line, to joining an illegal coup for one reason and one reason only. He had his lawyers, he looked around, and he determined he did not want to be, today, the seventh co-conspirator in this damning coup conspiracy indictment. 